Okay, midterm review on plots. First, we're going to talk about histograms. Histograms are um, a plot or a graph that represents a frequency distribution. They illustrate things like tendency toward normal distribution, other distribution patterns, left skew, right skew, bimodal, um, help us identify outliers and see the range of values. Remember, a frequency distribution is how many of each thing. So in this case, the frequency or how many of each um, observation of arrivals in minutes. So what do we think about that rainbow um, color scheme for a histogram? Hmm, it's a really good question. How about this? Can this be a histogram? Can we have histograms that are stacked like this? Sure, sure we can, why not? Yes, you can have a stacked histogram. It sure complicates things, but we can see overall that we've got a left skew um, and a strong right tail. Um, we can see even, you know, little bits of bimodalness happening here um, with the kind of blue color. Anyway, for what it's worth, I'd never seen anything like that before. All right, so taking a histogram to a box plot. Make sure you guys understand box and whisker plots. Um, just because they are such a slick way to show us the summary statistics for the distribution of a data set. Um, here's our histogram, right, where each one of these is an observation. And then it's just the idea of summarizing this into the box and whisker. So what is this, this middle line? What does that represent? Hopefully you guys know that this is the median. So half of the observations are above this point and half are below. That's our Q2. Our interquartile is defined by Q1, the range from Q1 to Q3. Where do we get these? It's half of half. So if this is our median, then half of the observations in the upper part, um, that half point is our Q3 and same with Q1. So on the low end, um, Half of the observations in the lower half of the data set uh, will be defined by the, the lower bound here. Um, and then so Q1 to Q3 should contain half the data. Um, how do we define these outliers? The interquartile range is just the difference between the value that's represented by Q3 or this halfway point. Um, we just difference these. We subtract Q1 from Q3 and then multiply that by 1.5 and add it to the upper value here of Q3. So this is our upper whisker limit and then anything outside of that is going to be defined as an outlier and the same goes for the lower end. So these are really straightforward, um, just arithmetic, right? But it's just how you divide up the data set, how you divide up the, the count of the different observations. Okay, um, if you have questions about that, definitely do some digging. Um, this will be on the midterm. Okay, so moving from uh, histograms and box and whiskers distributions to bar charts, take a look at this. Here's a bar chart. What could we do to improve this? Shout it out. Come on, what could we do to improve this chart? The things that come to my mind are A, get rid of the drop shadow. We could rotate it so that all these labels on the x-axis are easier to read. Then we don't have to rotate our head to read this. It could be horizontal. Why are we using color? You know, good rule of thumb is not to use color unless you really, really need to. Uh, the background grid, why do we need that? Um, we could label the ends of the bars instead of using this whole cluttered y-axis. Uh, we could probably sort it, right? These aren't even alphabetical, so it would be a pretty good idea to sort these, probably descending order. All right, bar charts, two axes. Usually one is categorical or nominal data like we have here. Any kind of discrete or non-continuous data and then the value associated with each discrete entity is gonna be on the other axis. Um, all right, that's that. 
Um, here's another one that I thought was kind of neat because we've talked about how stacked bar charts um, be become a little less effective because we lose our consistent baseline. But here, because we're showing profit and loss, our, um, we're kind of given a chance to have two consistent baselines, one for profits and one for losses. Uh, I just thought that was um, worth noting because there are different ways that you could create a meaningful midpoint, right? You could, you could change your data. So instead of showing values over time, you could calculate you know, the, the increase or decrease or some kind of change over time and um, plot it against a zero line like this. And that could be a pretty effective way to show that kind of data. Um, here, just as a reminder, stacked bar charts this way, um, it isn't always a bad idea to get multiple um, measurements into a bar chart like this, but when you normalize the data, instead of getting rid of the raw values, um, normalize it and make everything relative to a common denominator, like, you know, a percent, and then we have two common baselines. Um, we're only being asked to you know, kind of a struggle to keep track of the middle two variables. <laughs> All right, um, this one, oh, this is so ugly, I can hardly stand it. Um, I guess one question here, I should put this on the midterm and just tell you guys to explain to me all the different ways that we could clean this up. <laughs> but should this be sorted? Should we sort these bars? to um, create some order here? No. Here we have dates. This is the, the time that you can't or shouldn't ever sort your bar plots or your heights to make sense of the data and make them more readable. All right, so quickly, comparing histograms to bar charts. Um, we've talked before about how you can, um, you'll see classes or bins on the x-axis of a histogram, but a great way to tell, and this is just kind of a standard, is that on a histogram, there won't be any spaces between the bars. And in a bar chart, there will be spaces. Hopefully not ever this, this big of a gap, um, but you will have spaces between. And these are gonna be categories, which is different than a bin. This is discrete data. This is just classes of continuous data. All right, moving on to pie charts. Can anyone tell me the pie rules, the rules for pie charts? The biggest slice starts at 12 o'clock. They wrap clockwise, biggest to smallest. Really limit the number of slices you have in your pie. The values have to total 100%. Doesn't mean they can't be accompanied by, you know, a raw value or count, but it has to, it has to kind of total a whole. No 3D effects, period. And be color conscious. Don't just use color because it's there. Don't accept default colors. Really think about the relationships that you're implying when uh, you have similar colors and um, think about contrast and all the other things we've learned about with color theory to make sure you aren't um, you know, overselling one slice over another. Uh, let's just flop through some disasters. 3D pie charts, yuck. First of all, what is going on here? Here's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100%. How are there gaps here? This is just absolutely disgusting. But remember why we don't do 3D. If we actually counted the number of pixels that are being um, you know, shown for each slice, this is what we mean to be showing. So each pie is exactly the same size. But when you flip it to 3D, now you're overselling the one that's closest to you. We have, we have more pixels that are gray, right? And just a few more that are blue. Another disaster, gross. If you have to label a pie chart this way, you're doing something wrong. Find another way to display your quantities. This one's just eye candy. This one absolutely cracks me up. <laughs> Can't, I can't help it. That's hilarious that it's just over here. And finally, okay, moving on to scatter plots. Uh, scatter plots are there to show us the relationship between variables. 
And uh, this is kind of hard to see. I was trying to make it grayscale. Um, here we can see a very positive trend. We can see a positive relationship as one variable increases, so does the other one. Um, so make sure you're comfortable with describing um, relationships and scatter plots. Um, but if we were to color code this, so add color as an attribute, what's interesting, I think, is that we have that same trend here, but there's these two patterns. But here, uh, when we get into whatever group this is, and it doesn't matter, statin 10, there is a very clear negative relationship, right? So as this, as this variable is increasing, this variable decreases until you get to some other thing that's happening. There's some threshold here. The exact same pattern can be seen in statin 20. So we've got the same negative trend uh, and then positive. So I think I, I do think that you know there's value in uh, encoding multiple variables in scatter plots. Um, you've looked at a ton of these. Um, we're going to talk about proportional uh, symbols a little later. But um, what I think is really effective about this one is the average lines that are in there for context and the way that that makes quadrants. So we've got a quadrant where it's hotter and people are, I guess it's men, are shorter than, uh, I don't know what it is, the average doesn't really matter. Um, here they're looking at I guess this whole thing, I'm sorry, I'm digressing here a little bit. I think this was a plot. They were looking for some kind of relationship between average temperature in the country and the average height of the males in their population. Uh, and then this is just the overall population size is the size of the circle. So, and then I guess it's also colored by, uh, huh. I don't know. It's not quite, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what the colors. I would have said continent, but uh, that doesn't really seem to be true. Well, anyway, um, going back to what I was trying to say, that the world average lines create these four quadrants, which gives us, um, I think, just a really cool background context.